All right, so I know everyone's still trickling in, um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, just kick things off. Uh, once again, my name is Chris Fernari. I'm the editor of Brewbound. Uh, the two gentlemen sitting next to me here today, uh, I am very, very lucky to have uh, joining us today. Uh, Richard Weary from Fresh and Easy, he's the category manager, um, and, and he does all the beer buying for uh, about 150 or so locations. Well, we have 167 stores, and 163 of them sell beer and wine. Okay, so 163 stores that sell beer and wine, and, and this guy's uh, one of the key decision makers uh, for that grocery outlet, uh, primarily in Southern California. And the man to his right is Dan Partolo from Craft Brew Alliance. Uh, Dan has been around the beer industry for quite some time. Uh, he ran some of the Anheuser-Busch wholesalers for many, many years uh, before they sold to InBev. Uh, now sort of on the craft side uh, and working with Craft Brew Alliance, which as many of you know is Widmer, Red Hook, Kona, uh, Omission Beer, and Square Mile Cider. Uh, so he runs the whole West region for them and, and works very closely with guys like Richard uh, and all of his wholesale partners. So thank you very much for joining us today, guys. Hey, you're welcome. Big round of applause for them. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to these guys about today was uh, just some strategies for uh, performing a little bit better in key off-premise channels like a Fresh and Easy, uh, where you're trying to get your beer on the shelf uh, and in front of consumers uh, that are, you know, not necessarily the ones that are in uh, a bar like Ryan's, who was up here earlier today at the Surly Goat, or not necessarily the consumers that are buying uh, very expensive 750s or 22s at the bottle shop. Um, sort of your everyday customers uh, that might have a little bit of expendable income to spend on craft. Um, and, and Richard is doing some awesome things uh, trying to get craft beer more shelf space and uh, more access to his consumers. So um, I'll kind of start there with some introductions. Richard, let's start with you. Talk to me a little bit about the Fresh and Easy business and what you guys are doing with craft beer. All right, well, Chris. Fresh and Easy is focused on creating modern convenience for our customers. We have 167 stores, 163 of those sell beer and wine right now. We don't sell any spirits in our stores. And what we all know is that customers are time starved. So we have a large offering of fresh, fully cooked, and then partially cooked and uh, ready to go meals that customers can take home and either heat in the microwave or cook in the oven quickly. So we attract a younger demographic. We over-index with millennial consumers, with single uh, households, so people who don't have children yet, but also people with children who are going home, they don't have a lot of time to cook for the kids, or maybe they're trying to meet three or four different uh, dietary requirements. You know, their little kids don't want anything other than mac and cheese, but their wife wants fish and they feel like a steak, so they can pick all of that up in our stores. And in that backdrop, craft beer has done very well for us. We heard some figures earlier about how much craft beer accounts for in the total beer market here in Los Angeles. I think the figure that I heard tossed out was 5%. And I can tell you that at Fresh and Easy, in 2013, we did $21 million in beer sales, of which 38% was craft beer. Wow. So we highly over-index in craft beer, and it makes sense. We focus on more gourmet food. Taste is something that matters a lot to us, and people who care about taste care about craft beer. Right. And uh, Dan, as I mentioned, uh, sort of teased a little bit, you have an extensive experience on the wholesale side, so uh, maybe talk a little bit about where you've come from and where you are now. Well, thanks, Chris. So, I mean, I'm with CBA, obviously, now. We've got a, a pretty good line of products, as you mentioned, Kona, Widmere, Red Hook, and you talk a little bit, Rich and I were speaking earlier about the local phenomenon. We really experienced that in a lot of our markets up in Seattle and in Portland and certainly out in Hawaii 20, 30 years ago. So that whole local phenomena is something that we've, we've been privileged to go through and work through it. Um, but prior to that, I had a lot of experience on the wholesaler side of the business, which I think will be relevant to our conversation here because as, as folks like us try to, try to partner and, and, and work with big retailers like Richard and Fresh and Easy, it's really not just a supplier side, but it's really a team effort from a supplier and a wholesaler side of the business. And certainly, 
you can't accomplish what we need to do at your side of the business without being in unison with those, both those factions, both those tiers of the business. And uh, as we talk a little bit, I'll, I'll try to bring in some of my experience from the wholesaler side of it. And because and, and there's certainly lots of points of disconnection uh, before we get to your side of the business, Richard. And uh, the, the folks that can minimize that uh, are the ones that can bring a lot of value to your side of the business. Interesting. So uh, let's, let's take a step back before we get there. Uh, Richard, let's talk about some of the brands that you guys are interested in. Uh, I mean, not necessarily the specific brands that you guys, uh, you know, kind of target, but uh, maybe the characteristics that you look for in craft beer brands. 38% um, of your beer sales are coming from craft. So what's working in your stores? Uh, what, what styles are you paying attention to? Um, and how are you guys trying to sort of grow the overall market share for craft in L.A.? All right, well, when I first came to Fresh and Easy, we have 128 feet of chilled space for beer. And when I first started, 16 feet of that was dedicated to craft beer. Today, 48 feet of that are dedicated to craft beer, which is about 40% of the space, and it's in line with the sales the craft beer is doing. And every time we've expanded the number of square feet that we've given to craft beer, the sales have grown in line with that. So the customers are definitely looking for it. I'm not looking for a specific style. In fact, what I see is that craft beer consumers like to experiment. Multi-buy promotions work well for us, where a customer can save when they buy more than one because it encourages trial. And local is what really sets us apart. We don't want to be another box retailer who's competing on price. We've tried that. It doesn't work for our model. We want to be a retailer who competes based on offering local beers that you can't find in other retailers. Maybe they're only available, in fact, at the brewery. And we'll talk about that hopefully a little later. And get the craft beer enthusiasts into the store. Those are the people who are going to enjoy our ready-made meals the most anyway. So what I see driving craft beer in my segment, in my stores, selection local connection with a local brewery that the customers heard about and something unique that they can't find anywhere else so i heard a couple of things there you it's it seems like you're using uh craft to drive uh business in other parts of your store is that fairly accurate that's right in fact we've carved out eight feet of chilled space in our meat fish and poultry aisle right above the steak poultry sections because beer pairs fantastically with proteins and will actually offer customers a percentage off or a dollar off a beer when they buy one of our meat items as a way of introducing it to them. And the majority of customers walk down the meat and fish and poultry aisle and then some subset of that will walk down the alcohol aisle. So it also gets beer out of the beer set and into a different part of the store where the customer can find it. And are you dedicating that space primarily to craft, or are there some larger... 100% demand? craft. 100% craft in those areas. That's right. Interesting. Now, um, one of the other things you said uh, was that you, you try to focus uh, a little bit on local. Dan, uh, CBA isn't local here in LA, uh, so that, that must be a little bit of a challenge when you have a guy like Richard saying, yeah, we want to we want to give more space to the local LA brands. How do you cut through that with a brand like Widmer or Red Hook or Kona, which aren't necessarily native to LA? Well, I, I, Chris, I'll remind you that Kona <clears throat> is really only 30 miles away if you take out the water. Okay, so <laughs> if you take um, out the water, if you yeah, remove the Pacific Ocean. We're really local. Yeah, um, you know, it's a great question. All kidding aside, and um, you know, I, I will, I, if I could maybe morph the answer a little bit in because I also heard selection. And the interesting thing about that is we try to prepare our calls with folks like Richard and, 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 and Darcy on your team to, you know, when we come in and talk to you about how do we provide relevant beers that are going to drive velocity? Because at the end of the day, what we need to do is give you products that the consumers are willing to buy, whether it's variety packs, seasonal products, things like that, that are going to increase your velocity. And to us, that's what we focus on. And that's a challenge for our system. Okay, so we're focusing on how do we take that space on the shelf and up the velocity on whatever's sitting there. And I think that that's, that's important and that's how we approach it. So I know I'm not getting exactly to the, to the local question, um, but we want to have brands that are relevant. Certainly we have a lot of brands that are relevant. Cone is one of them here in Southern California, great trends. But the challenge is what packages and what brands do we get out of those brand families that are going to up your velocity? 
And talking a little bit about the three-tier system, that's a challenge because the basis to velocity is making sure you can provide that product consistently and reduce out of stocks and making sure our whole system can give you that product when you need it and you don't have out of stocks on the shelf because velocity is killed by things like out of stocks and when you start talking about seasonals and variety packs that's a very difficult segment of the business to forecast and supply so that's how we prepare when we go to market and how we go to we do buyer calls and partner with big retailers like richard interesting so um there's a lot of small brewers out there uh, that might not be able to make the case that you just made, uh, that might not be able to say, look, we're going to guarantee that uh, our, our out-of-stocks are not a problem for you. We're going to drive some greater velocity for you, and, and here's how we're going to do it. Uh, but then you're sort of sitting on the other side of the table and saying, like, I hear all that, I understand that, but I really do want to drive some local brands, and I really do want to drive... Uh, some of the producers that are in this area that consumers are asking for. So how do you balance the two, Richard? And um, how tough is that of a, a decision for you? It's an extremely tough decision. I work with 50 distributors to service 163 stores, and I carry 180 beers. So the number of beer distributor store combinations that I have to sort through, and it can be different across brands, uh, it is overwhelming. And so the key word is flexibility. So, for example, you know, uh, Jay Talley here with Legends Beer is a local brewer that we're working with. And one of the ideas that we have to differentiate ourselves in the market is to offer growlers in our stores of local beer that you would normally only find at the brewery. So a brewery might be selling in the retail channel their top three beers. Well, we want to get some of those other beers that are only available at the brewery in a growler in our stores. And so we've partnered with Legends Beer as an example of this, and they're going to visit our stores directly, dropping off these growlers so that we can get them between the time that they're filled and to our store in less than 24 hours. And so actually it, circumnavigating the, the three-tier? No, you can't legally circumnavigate the three-tier system. So they have so a they are brewery going and distribution okay. license. But one of the ideas that we've had is that we might be able to get other breweries to piggyback with them. So let's say Legends Beer picks up some kegs from other breweries, fills them, and delivers them when they're making the trip to our store as well. And that allows us to carve out our own area. So for example, uh, when I'm bringing on a craft beer, one of my challenges is my definition of Southern California might differ from every single one of the 50 distributors that I work with. They may say, well, for us, Southern California only goes up to Los Angeles. Another distributor says, well, actually, it's Bakersfield. Another distributor might go as far as Fresno, but not include you know, the coastal communities. And by you know, finding flexible ways to get your beer into our stores, not being locked into one distribution model, allows us to act quicker. And then if the beer does well in our stores, well, then you go back to your distribution partners and you say, hey, we tried this with Fresh and Easy. It worked really well. Let's find a way to work it through the normal channels. But experiment, be flexible, go out of the box. Find different ways to get beer into the retail channel. Interesting. Sounds like a headache for you. Well, uh, you know, it'd be easier if we hadn't had prohibition in the first place. <laughs> but uh, I don't have a Doctor Who time machine to go back and <laughs> slap some sense into people. So um, 163 stores, 50 wholesalers, 180 different beer companies, you said. I mean, how are you able to work with all those people effectively and uh, how much sort of uh, local buying power do you give the managers in uh, some of your stores to say, all right, I've identified, you know, these local brands that are in this small footprint and, and we think we should be putting them on the shelf? Yeah, uh, three good questions there, I think. So the first one I would say is, 
you know, working with very strong distribution partners who understand our business, close communications. The more information that we can share with them, the better. You know, it's like that, you know, uh, game you used to play in school where you have a ring of people sitting together and you whisper something in one person's ear and by the time it gets back around to you, it's changed. Telephone. Exactly. So working with distribution partners to make sure that all of my stores, all of their distributors are on the same page and getting out of, ahead of time is the only real way to tackle it. So very close communications with our distributor partners and having a key point of contact. For example, the Rays Holding Group. You know, they really embody uh, a large territory. They cover 77 of some of my best stores. And I work with Tom Cressman, who is with just one of the harbor houses, but he's taken on the burden of communicating what we're doing at Fresh and Easy to the rest of his group so that they can respond quickly to our needs. Right. And then we just have that constant back and forth and when a hiccup comes up, you know, like a, a certain beer is not carried in one of the different Ray's houses, we adjust and either, you know, the Ray's folks are flexible and they add it into that house at our request, or we adapt our strategy. But it's all about communication. So that's at the wholesale level. 40% uh, of your cold space is dedicated to craft. How much of those buying decisions are you making and how much of the buying decisions are you letting uh, the folks beneath you make at the local level? Well, as you know, we've recently gone through a change in ownership. So previously, Fresh and Easy was owned by Tesco. Tesco is the world's second or third largest retailer, depending on who you ask. And everything there was very centrally controlled. No store had autonomy to make any decisions. And our new CEO, Jim Keyes, former CEO of 7-Eleven, is coming from the exact opposite approach, which is you've got a few core items, you know, you've got to have Coke, you've got to have Pepsi, but devolve as much power to make local decisions to the store managers as possible. And we're rolling out a trial to start doing that in a few stores, technically, you know, to, to be able to do that in a few stores in the next couple of months. And then our goal would be that all of our store managers have the ability to bring in great local items for approximately 50 to 60% of the range. So they'll all probably have the Keystone items, they'll probably have the Key Lagunitas items, but they'll be able to bring in that local craft beer that their customers are asking for. And then the challenge with that is that we got to make sure that our store managers have the education and the support to make good decisions. And so you can actually just say, all right, it's going into these 10 stores, that, that small brand. It's not going to go to 50, it's not going to go to 100, or 150, it's going to stay here. Even if it only went in one store, it's worth it. Interesting. Um, Dan, that, that seems like it would present you know, some pretty uh, hectic challenges, for, especially for wholesalers. Um, but also for you know a, a larger brand like CBA that uh, you know probably wants a better crack at that space. So um, when you hear Richard make comments like this about giving more power to the local buyers, what's going on in your head? So I, I, I will say jump balls are exciting. So we kind of call them jump balls at store level, and you know I, I think the key to being able to operate. First off, we're seeing that philosophy. In a, lot of, in a lot of our large customers, they're giving a lot more uh, autonomy to the local operators, which I think is smart. I mean, that, that's the way the business is going. So what that, the challenge for us as a supplier and then as a, as, a, as a supplier wholesaler chain is to make sure, number one, we have really good communication. So as a supplier, we have to make sure we're communicating our brand objectives down into our wholesaler system and make sure that they're aligned on what we're trying to do with that brand. And then also, we have to make sure that we're working with our wholesaler partners to make sure that we have a, a good level of objectivity as they go to your store managers. Certainly we're all competitive and we all want to get that extra space, but we want to be good category partners with you. So as we approach your store directors and the folks that have decision making at the store level, we have to be objective about it. And we got to make sure we're driving the entire category. So we make sure that we align our brand goals coming out of us as a supplier down into our wholesalers and making sure that that gets communicated properly to get those jump balls. And certainly, we're going to put our little spin on that, but we, at the end of the day, 
if you want to be a good long-term partner, you have to make sure you're being objective and driving the category, and we make sure we try to do that. How much of these decisions are being based on uh, data that you're looking at or that you're providing? I mean, how much does that weigh into the, the, whether or not you put the brand on the shelf? AC Nielsen and IRI provide an excellent uh, list of what is selling at Walmart, Kroger, and Safeway. I don't want to sell what Walmart, Kroger, and Safeway sell. That's not to say I don't look at that data. I do because it informs which pack sizes of Miller, Bud, and Coors I need to carry. And that's important because that's some of my customers. But it doesn't have anything to do at all with the decisions that I make about craft. Hmm. What I read on blogs, what I hear from my store managers, and what I hear from the people who drink craft beer that I know in the office have a much larger bearing on the decisions. I would rather be the first retailer to carry some cool new beer that has never garnered any sales anywhere else than to get something that's up and coming on AC Nielsen or IRI but is in every single store that my competitors manage and I'm going to be competing on price alone. Interesting. So with that said, how can a small brewer uh, get on your radar then if somebody in your office hasn't uh, hit Ryan's bar at the Surly Goat for a pint or um, you haven't read it on a blog? All right. So I came here in part to announce an open door policy of Fresh and Easy to all of the local craft brewers in Los Angeles, and for that matter, in any of the markets that we have stores in. My name is Richard Wary, Richard Wary, well, richard.wary at freshandeasy.com. <laughs> the best way to get in front of me is to email me, and we'll have you in. We'll try your beer, and if you can be flexible with us and find a way for us to get your cool new beers into our stores, we will carry you. Interesting. So um, it sounds like cachet is enough to get your foot in the door. Uh, so if Vinny from Russian River were to trot down here to Southern California and say, hey, uh, have you heard about this beer, Pliny the Elder, that everybody loves on every blog? And I would probably drive up there and load it into my own car. <laughs> <laughs> if he would agree to give me enough to put in my stores, uh, I have received so many requests from store managers and from personal friends, get this beer. And the challenge is, frankly, uh, the distributors don't have enough stock for us and it's hard to service my stores. I'd love to have that beer in my stores. Right. Um, that, that can't go on forever. I mean, you, you, it's, it sounds very idealistic to me to say we have an open door policy, but the, the second that that shelf space is empty from the brand that you wanted to take a chance on, doesn't that hurt your business? With the 180 beers that we have, uh, would you believe that I am gapping on 34 beers at any one time? Hmm. And usually that's because, you know, as I said, we have 50 beer distributors. We may have as many as realistically five or six calling on a store. And they have minimum delivery amounts. They don't want to visit the store if they don't have an order of 40 cases. So let's say we've sold out of three of the beers they deliver and we need you know, uh, a case of each, or maybe two cases of each, they're going to wait until we can order 40 cases before they show up. I don't have a problem with space on my shelves. I have a problem with filling space on my shelves. Interesting. Um, it, 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 just for the record, we, we have a lot of beer that we can put on your shelves. So you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you know what? That's why we have your beers in our store. I appreciate that. Um, well, and that, and that was why I was going to sort of toss it to you, Dan. I mean, uh, Andy Thomas, CBA's CEO, for those who don't know, but um, he said this earlier this week, and he said it before at some of our events. He says, uh, you know, national, not to say that you're national, but national retailers might appreciate small, quirky brands, but they don't appreciate small, quirky service. Um, and, and what you've just described, uh, you know, wholesalers not wanting to deliver uh, unless they get a 40 case <laughs> drop, um, brands that might run into out-of-stock issues, that sounds like small, quirky service to me. So um, 
Dan, when you're talking to the other retailers out there that maybe aren't Richard, that aren't as willing to sort of deal with those complexities, uh, is it true, are you finding that retailers are willing to put up with some of these small startups like Richard is, uh, and how has this sort of impacted your guys' business? Uh, I mean, that's a, a multi-dimensional question, but I, I will kind of veer back to what Richard's talking about in terms of having empty shelves. And our, our goal as a supplier and as a supplier wholesaler partner is never to have, uh, have empty shelves on, on any of our customers that have given us the privilege of putting our beers on the shelf. And that may sound a bit corny, but you know, we, we realize that that, there, that is a margin kill when you do that. And I think the challenge for folks like Richard is how do you, how do you balance that out? How do you get the variety and the, and the, the, the real local and the, the, you know, maybe the one-offs for a better, lack of a better term, some of the seasonals and the one-offs that come in that the people are really requesting and have them and whoever's on that pay the rent on that portion of the shelf. And so we're really cognizant about that, um, about making sure that, that the offerings that we're bringing have relevance to the consumer but also have great margins and also we can supply it at the right time. We can get it at the right, into the wholesale at the right time and we can get the wholesale to make sure they deliver it on a consistent basis to the right time. So we, we're challenged with that on our side of the business. You know, I know it's a balancing act for yourself. Sounds like you're a little bit more, uh, uh, you're, you're okay with, with balancing that because of your go-to-market strategy with the consumers wanting to offer some of those, those uh, really unique type of offerings. But we're, we're very, we're very, focused on, on making sure that we don't do that. And in fact, to the point where we've reduced the amount of SKUs that we have coming into this year, Chris, you and I had talked about it previously, we actually took a whole bunch of SKUs out of our portfolio because we want to go with higher velocity SKUs and we want to make sure that we can supply those on a consistent basis across the country. And that's, that's a challenge. What do you think about that decision, Richard? Well, I understand why Craft Brewers Alliance is making that decision. Um, I've got to think about my stores. What I want to see is a fantastic portfolio of local craft beer. That is not necessarily synonymous with Velocity. Uh, Velocity is synonymous with 1799 30-pack uh, tri-brew beer. And that's great for Kroger or Safeway, not so good for Fresh and Easy. And so the balancing act that Dan's talking about here is that we do need to carry some of those high velocity items to help make up that 40 case minimum. And one of the reasons we do is to help make up that 40 case minimum. But we also are pushing our distribution partners to carry a good selection of local craft beers, which we may only sell a couple units of each week. But we'd much rather sell a couple of those because the customer is so valuable to us they're going to spend money in other areas in our shop. They care about quality food. They're not shopping us just on price. And it differentiates us, frankly, from everybody else. So, you know, there's some give and take. We've got to pay for their trucks to drive out there. It's a lot of gas. Somebody has to be driving the truck, show up, roll up the back door. But at the same time, we want to have unique items that are local. Right. So a uh, couple of questions for you guys. Um, your email's now out there. Uh, you've opened the door to folks who uh, might be small, might have limited production capabilities, uh, but you want them on the shelf. So when they rock, walk through your door, when they get into your office to, to pitch you their brand, uh, what kinds of things do you think uh, they should be armed with and how should they be prepared to, to sell their brand into you? And I think both of you guys could probably comment on this. So we'll start with you, Richard. Okay. Well, my expectations when meeting with a local craft brewery would be to hear about their involvement in the community, what kind of efforts they have as far as getting word out about their beer in the community. I essentially would look at a brewery like Angel City, where we are today, and by the way, we're going to be adding their Angelino IPA into my stores as soon as I can work out the distribution challenges. <laughs> but I view breweries like this as an opportunity to connect with our consumers and to drive that craft beer consumer into my stores. So what's going to you know, set all the right bells off for me is someone who comes in and says, Richard, we have this great local brewery. We've got uh, 
you know, our beer in several different local brew pubs, and we're going to talk about the fact that it's in fresh and easy in our social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, our website, so that the customers who love our beer know that fresh and easy carries it, and we're going to drive that traffic to you. And that's the kind of so reciprocal want, relationship that we're looking for. You want to see them do a little bit of work on, on their end as well to, to, to drive traffic to your store. That's right. Don't just sell me the beer and ask me to go out and get the customers. The reason that it's great to buy a local beer is that you should already have a relationship with the local community. Right. So come to me and tell me how you're going to help drive customers to me and give me some opportunities to participate in some events with you. I'm happy to come out to the brewery if you're having an event and to talk about what's great about Fresh and Easy outside of just beer, for example. And oh, by the way, your beer is available in our stores. I'm available to get you involved in other social media events. We do a lot of events with Yelp. We're a big sponsor of them. We donate product. Maybe you'd like to reach out to a larger community in San Diego or up in NorCal or even just here locally. We'd be happy to take your beers to that Yelp event, pour them, have you there with us to talk about your beers, and say, by the way, they're available at Fresh and Easy. That's where we went. Sounds, sounds like a pretty mutually beneficial relationship, especially you know, starting on that small level. But when you, when, when you grow, when a, when a brewery is scaling up, um, and they're able to maybe do a little bit more things and get into some more of your outlets, um, I think that that's a different conversation that they're probably having with you other than, you know, I'm going to go talk to the guys on Yelp. Dan, talk to me about some of the complexities that brewers will face when they take that next step and they need to show some sales data, they need to show how their products are actually performing uh, on the shelves. I, I think it, it positions us, first off, Team Fresh and Easy, starting with Richard, have always been great partners. We've always had an open door and our teams work really well together. And, thank you for the business and I, I'll thank you for the, I think it, what, I, what our job turns into that now as we go in and continue our partnership is how do we remain relevant? How do we continue to bring, how do we take a look at how his categories morph and clearly his, his go-to-market strategy is beginning to morph a little bit. How do we make sure that we can st still be relevant in his stores given that he's opened the door for us and we've been partners in the past? So that may look differently. That may look like us providing good category information being good partners because we have the ability to get good data, whether it's Nielsen data, IRI data, and we come in and make sure that we're offering that and letting him know what's going on in the market and understanding how the brands, because we're not all about the big five or six brands we have. We have all kinds of other but if you're brands. But if you're a local brewer and you've made that jump, what are you thinking about providing Richard uh, your, your Hangar 24, your Golden Road, you're somebody that's uh, a little bit more uh, well-equipped to handle the the kind of things that, the, that you need to do to, to stay in the store now. You've, you've gone past the, uh, the localness, the we're cool, we're new, we're young, and we're not going to be on your shelves for more than a week. And I, I think that answer, Chris, honestly remains the same, whether you're Hangar 10, whether you're um, Golden Road, whether you're Stone, whether you're us. Once you start moving out of that, you have to remain relevant. You have to make sure you're coming to the party with something. And, and, and if, 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 if Richard's describing that his business is changing, we have to make sure we change with it. And honestly, if we don't have a brand or a series of brand or a brand family that fits into his changing business model, we have to go figure that out. And we have to work with you to produce something that fits into your business model. So I don't think that changes. I mean, certainly as you scale up and you get past it, maybe it's something that's really local and you get into a regional player or you get into a national player like CBA, you have to remain relevant with, with, with the customer like Richard. Uh, one of the things we haven't touched on in all this is pricing. Um, and I, I think that's a, a pretty relevant point of discussion. Um, velocity and pricing are, are often interrelated, but um, what, are you, what are you noticing in terms of pricing trends? Are, are you seeing uh, bombers get too expensive? Are six packs in line? Are, are breweries trying to discount? Um, what are the pricing trends in LA and, and what do you look for in, in terms of proper pricing for your customers? Well, you know, I have stores in NorCal, SoCal, Las Vegas, and Phoenix, and the pricing is different across the markets. For craft beer, we don't really see consumers being very price sensitive. It needs to be a fair price. It can't be an offensive price. You can't walk into a store and 
see a six pack of Lagunitas for thirteen ninety nine. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be the cheapest price. And interestingly, unlike wine, craft beer hasn't been footballed as much by the big players. We see some multi-buys on six packs, so buy four six packs, get 30% off. I think that's a good offer. I think four six packs might be a little bit much. We're who's, hammering. Who's driving that kind of a, a promotion? Safeway. Okay. In our, in our market. And I think the four, pack, four six packs is a little bit much. We're you know, debating two, uh, buy two six packs, for example, get 20% off to set the bar a little lower. So we'll set a fair price, not the lowest in the market, but then all of our beer is chilled and we compete on our fresh products more. So no have, warm space in your stores. No warm space in our stores. I, uh, you know, one of the first things I did when I started managing beer was I reached out to Stone Brewing because I like drinking Arrogant Bastard. And Marty Saylor was the national sales manager at the time and he came in and he uh, told me that while he really appreciated sales and some other channels, that it was important to keep the beer chilled to maintain the quality, and he converted me at that time. So we changed all of our beer space to chilled only. Wow. And I think that's an important distinction at Fresh and Easy. So we feel like we can charge a fair price, and then if you purchase multiple units, we'll, we'll give you a, a percentage off. We haven't decided what that's going to be yet, but we do want to reward people coming to us as their craft beer destination. Interesting. Um, Dan, what are you noticing on, on pricing out there? Obviously, you guys do a little bit different business than some of the smaller brands. You're able to do variety packs. You're able to maybe run some promotions uh, on some of your products. What are you noticing out there? Uh, I, I mean, in some respects, pricing, it's always been a lever in our business. You know, it's always, pricing has always been, uh, had the ability to drive, you know, trial and purchase, but I will say it's gotten a lot more psychotic, frankly. You, you'll sit in any cooler and you'll see the entry level 21 to 24 year old come up on a Friday night and look at that cooler, and they be, they be sitting in front of your uh, bomber section, Richard, and they're going like looking and they're shopping, and they'll walk over and buy a 12-pack of Bud Light or Coors Light, and then they'll go back to the bomber section, and they'll pick out a couple 699, 79-mine bombers. So it's, it's completely on both ends of the spectrum, and I think you know, consumers are willing to, to, to stay on both sides of that right now, depending on their use occasion. And that makes it challenging for all of us. But certainly, you know, the, the high margin bomber sections are great for trial. They're, they're, they're great for being able to, to sample variety. And I think that's important. But the pricing thing has really gotten challenging for all of us because you can, you can, you can, you can go out. If you're in the on-premise, you don't mind buying a $250 half barrel. But then again, you can't sell that as a, you know, $29.99, 12 back in the store. And so it, it's a challenge. Right. Um, final question before we uh, wrap up here, and uh, Richard, I know, I know you sort of teased it earlier, um, but you know, the, the, the question came up in the earlier conversation this evening, uh, you know, what's it going to take to sort of grow overall market share for craft in LA? Um, you know, craft isn't necessarily underdeveloped here, in fact, uh, it's one of the larger markets for craft if you look at it on a volume basis, but if you look at it on a percentage basis, the numbers aren't so sexy. Uh, what are some innovative ways that you as a retailer and, and Dan, you as a supplier, can help grow the overall share of craft in L.A.? Um, and uh, Richard, I think you had some you know, unique ways of going about this. Yeah, we had, uh, we've had some success recently educating customers on eggs. The average time that an egg sits in a grocery store or in the distribution channel before the consumer picks it up is six weeks. Wow. The egg was laid six weeks ago. Fresh and Easy has the only program that I'm aware of that delivers eggs from the hen to the store in 72 hours. And we do it quicker, but we've got to wait 24 hours just for the shell to harden so that we can put it in a carton. And we're able to do this because we visit our stores every single day with a delivery. 
To my knowledge, no other retailer anywhere in the US does that. But it's because we have our own warehouse where we make all of our own ready-made meals that day to be consumed that day and we deliver them out to stores. So we're able to get the eggs to stores very quickly. So freshness is an important aspect of it. And where this can be relevant to differentiating craft beer, well, imagine how long a regular Miller Coors Bud beer has been out there before the consumer gets it. You know, we're always running into code life issues with some of these traditional beers. Craft beer, especially local beer, promises the customer fresh product. And it's as important in beer as it is in eggs or any of the produce that people pick up. People want fresh product. And so craft breweries, if they can find flexible ways to work with retailers, can tout that. We work with the dudes in the South Bay, Strand Brewing. We're putting together some programs with uh, a couple other local breweries to do a growler program where we're going to be able to say, this beer was brewed 24 hours ago and we're only going to give it three days code. After that, we're going to pitch it. We're going to assume the entire cost for that. I assume you mean packaged, not brewed. That's right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a beer brewed 24 hours ago. It might not have quite the, uh, quite in the potent, uh, potency that I'd want, but, um, but yeah, package. So you, you actually want to do growler programs, and, and that makes me think a little bit about um, on-premise opportunities within grocery accounts, which I've seen a little bit of. Uh, Whole Foods is experimenting even with you know, doing their own breweries in some, some of their stores. Um, but there's a lot of stores up in Northern California, some independent chains as well that, you know, have, you know, you can go in and get a beer in a pint glass and, and not necessarily drink while you shop, but uh, shop and then drink. Uh, is that something you guys are looking at? Yeah, it's, you know, the legislation around it's interesting. We were working with a company called Growler Station and we thought we might enjoy filling growlers in our own stores. Turns out that's not legal in California. I could do it in my Arizona stores right now. Uh, and hopefully that'll change down the road. But we could work with a local brewer to fill growlers for us and then deliver them to our stores or deliver them to our warehouse and we could deliver them to our stores on our own trucks. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. It's just a matter of willingness to experiment with something new. So the freshness angle I think is an important one. And then educating consumers that you know, you're doing this locally, it's part of the community, has the same cachet with produce that you go to Whole Foods or Sprouts and you see these are the guys who grew my potatoes. Well, same with beer. Innovative ways suppliers can work with uh, retailers, Dan. Well, I, I think Richard kind of summed it up. We gotta, if, if, if he's looking at, at on-premise samplings, then we have to find a way. Our system, again, has to find a way to be able to morph into that. And I don't know that our classic, traditional, you know, supplier distribution method is ready for that sort of stuff. So when you push us that direction, we got to figure out a way. It goes back to my, my point about being relevant. We got to figure out a way to, to partner with, with you to be able to figure that out, because that's the way the consumers are going. I mean, just a quick comment on, your, on the craft business in Los Angeles. And I think the, the guys up here that were up here earlier really kind of summed it up and the wave is happening and it's not going to stop because the consumers want it. And I think it's an exciting time to be here, especially in Southern California. You look down and I mean, you know, depending on the data you look at, the craft business in Los Angeles is 10 or 12%. You look down in San Diego, it's 25. You look up in Oregon, it's 40 to 50%. And it's, it's coming this direction. And it, you know, in Los Angeles, is, it's going to get to the point where San Diego is. So it's an exciting time to be in the business in this town right here. So I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm listening to what folks are doing. I'm, things like, you know, Angel City, things like Golden Road, Legends, they're, they're all doing the right stuff. And, and, and I st still think they're in on it at the ground floor, basically. And I don't think it's a much developed market, but I think there's a lot of run room. So it's an exciting time to be in Southern Cal. Yeah, yeah it's definitely happening uh, all over the country, not only here in L.A., uh, certainly, you know, having uh, more local breweries plays into that. But... Um, 
also finding innovative retailers like yourself, Richard, that are willing to take a few risks uh, and look at new ways of selling beer to consumers uh, definitely moves the needle a little bit more. So um, cheers to you for doing that. And uh, thank you for sharing your insights and some strategies with our audience today. Uh, do we have any questions? We got time for a couple if anyone has any. Uh, otherwise, we can go get another beer and you can pick these, their brains, uh, these guys' brains all night long. <laughs> all right, let's get a beer. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Cheers.